Good Thursday evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the fourth keynote conversation in our week-long virtual WACA 2020 National Conference, New Frontiers in Diplomacy and National Security. My name is Bill Clifford. I'm president and CEO of the World Affairs Councils of America. And I'm delighted tonight to present to you a dynamic duo, Farah Pandith and Dr. Nina Ansari. The topic of tonight's discussion is how we win the role of women in driving nonviolent change. And it's a really such an honor for me to present both of these women because I've known one virtually and one in person. Farah Pandith, as a former board member of the World Affairs Council of Boston, I've been trying to convene you for, well, decades, frankly. So finally, and Nina, you have uh, appeared on our cover to cover program a couple of times with your books and we've had brainstorming dinners in New York and the like. And so it's a pleasure to see you again. For a formal introduction, Farah Pandith is an author, foreign policy strategist and former diplomat with expertise in countering violent extremism. She's currently a senior fellow with the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. We had Belfer people on yesterday. Farah spoke at many of our councils after her book came out in the spring of 2019. Its title is How We Win, How Cutting Edge Entrepreneurs, Political Visionaries, Enlightened Business Leaders, and Social Media Mavens Can Defeat the Extremist Threat. And if you fall into those categories, you can help. Farah served as a political appointee under both Presidents Bush, 41 and 43, and President Obama. Most recently, she was the first ever special representative to Muslim communities, serving both Secretaries Clinton and Kerry. In addition to senior roles at the NSC, State, and USAID, Farah has also served on the Department of Homeland Security's Advisory Council, chairing its task force on countering violent extremism. Nina. Dr. Nina Ansari, also an author, historian, and women's rights advocate. She has been named and is currently a UN Women Global Champion for Innovation and, as a, and is a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics Center for Women, Peace, and Security. Therefore, she gets invited a lot to present her work on women's rights and the impact of systemic gender, gender discrimination at universities and conferences in the US and the UK. She is the author of Anonymous is a Woman, a Global Chronicle of Gender Inequality that came out in March, and Jewels of Allah, the Untold Story of Women in Iran, which garnered many awards, including the 2016 International Book Award in Women's Issues. We featured her for cover to cover then. Nina was awarded the 2019 Ellis Island Medal of Honor and received the 2020 Outstanding Alumni Award from Columbia University's Graduate School of Arts and Scientists, where she received her MA in Middle Eastern Studies and a PhD in History. Nina, over to you. Welcome to you. Welcome to Farah. Welcome, Farah. Thank you, Bill, for that lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be back and in conversation with Farah. Farah, it's been a pleasure to virtually meet you. I hope we can do this in person someday. I do too, and thank you. Thank you very much. Farah, in uh, relation to today's conversation, uh, which is the role of women in bringing nonviolent change, specific, specifically in the realm of social justice, and the incredible work that you do, you are a pioneer, a trailblazer, and a leader in the field of countering violent extremism. I was reading your um, amazing book, which I mentioned to you when we spoke prior to going live that I'm almost done with it and I'm very much enjoying it. What struck me the most and really resonated uh, is the fact that you bring up the importance of collaboration uh, across different sectors. And you also bring up an important point, which is uh, sort of segues into the work that I do in terms of uh, violent extremism and globalist policies are currently not only inadequate, but they are more than likely not to end violent extremism. And in my line of work, I always say the current policies res with respect to gender parity, um, gender equality are also insufficient. And as we've seen during the COVID pandemic, uh, the fact is that these vulnerabilities are now coming to the surface, that the reforms we have are narrow at best, and uh, which is why uh, we are kind of in a revolving door and uh, we are 
really uh, moving at a glacial pace, so to speak. What the COVID-19 pandemic has done is essentially derail progress towards gender equality. And what can we now do as a community, as society globally, one, to minimize the setbacks? But my concern is mostly um, women and girls in fragile settings. What happens is uh, these settings are already vulnerable to gender-based violence. Uh, last year alone, according to UN Women, 243 million women and girls worldwide were subject to acts of gender-based violence. Those numbers are going up. Just recently, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres noted the horrifying surge in domestic violence. Uh, child marriage was happening at a rate of 12 million a year. That means every two seconds, a young girl is married against her will. Um, ending child marriage, ending gender-based violence is an indispensable goal of the women, peace and security agenda. And uh, ending it will mean uh, that you can get women and girls out of cycles of poverty, um, you know, a disempowerment, gender inequality, not to mention their huge potential in the workforce and economy, which is now being compromised. Farah, in, with respect to the, today's conversation and the women, peace and security agenda and supporting the women, peace and security agenda, specifically as countless studies have shown and also a growing body of scholarly research has shown that women's meaningful participation in peace processes is an essential component for sustainable peace and the fact is that women are continuously underrepresented, marginalized, and excluded from peace building and peacekeeping processes. Now, at this juncture, uh, I feel that their presence is all the more valuable, specifically in fragile settings. And you brought up collaboration across different sectors in terms of bringing about meaningful change and comprehensive legal reforms beyond the narrow reforms we currently have in place. How do you feel that we can leverage partnerships in order to increase women's voices, uh, women's perspectives and integrate them in the recovery and response efforts for COVID-19 specifically in fragile settings? Well, first of all, Nina, I appreciate you sort of laying out um, a really tragic scenario in terms of our global ecosystem that we have. Mm -hmm. It was tragic before COVID. It's, it's obviously amplified um, the seriousness and the consequences uh, because of COVID. Uh, so I wanna take a step back for a minute and just, and just let us just absorb that. Um, things did not start uh, in January of 2020. Um, we have had decades and decades of inaction by leaders all over the world, um, an insufficient amount of attention uh, to the issues that you just raised. We have had an insufficient amount of money given to NGOs that are doing this work because we have not valued the, the importance of civil society and communities, and we have not spent enough time developing the kinds of networks that we need. So that hasn't happened. It isn't that there were not actors out there seeing all this stuff, understanding how important it was, but we didn't see the kind of um, attention uh, and strategy that should have been put into place by policymakers and others, um, because frankly, the issue of women and girls has always been a side issue. It's been something that they've added on. It hasn't been a mainstream thing. And I, I, I think I will get pushback from people who say it is a mainstream thing now. I'm not so sure. However, um, there is more attention to it and we are seeing uh, you know, more stories, more connection, more reality around this. So when you ask the question about what we need to do to collaborate, I wanna, I wanna tell you that no matter what we're talking about, whether it is climate change, whether it is human trafficking, whether it is the issue that I've been working on since 9-11, which is countering violent extremism, no, no matter what we're talking about, including COVID, mm -hmm. nothing can happen in one silo. It isn't just about the business community that needs to fix this or the government community that needs, or, you know, or the uh, multinationals. It is very clear to me that on human problems, we have to have 
a collective change in the way we understand how to solve problems. I call that open power. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that on the issue of women and girls, as we touch these different issues, um, the first is, are we going to see the kind of dedication and leadership in a post-COVID world where, in fact, um, we aren't just putting the issue of women and girls you know, as part of the agenda, but not a serious part? And two, um, what can we do to ask different kinds of questions about the things that they're facing? I think one of the, the key things that I have seen, both at my work in my work in government and out of it, is that there is an expectation that we know everything. You know, we've seen it all, we understand it all, and so we don't ask questions of the people that are actually going through this. Mm -hmm. Circumstances have changed, demographics have changed. So um, for me, it, it is really a series of things that we need to ask ourselves as humans in a post-COVID world about the world we want to build um, and how we're going to get there collaboratively. Well, thank you, Farah. That's, that's a very important perspective. Are you referring to how can we as a community, as different societies that are really part and parcel of the same narrative globally, how do you mobilize resources and expertise, as you mentioned in your book as well, um, from social scientists, diplomats, even I wanted to bring up global youth yes. for a number of reasons. Yep. One is uh, I really feel with the advent of technology, the world is more interconnected than ever before. Um, in many ways, that's a huge opportunity, but at the same time, it's a huge responsibility. Um, meaning that, you know, in terms of identity formation, what yeah. kind of messages are we imparting to a new generation? I'm the mother of a 24 year old and I'm always concerned about what kind of messages as role models, and I'm not saying I'm a role model, but if you're sitting there and you have a verified page on Twitter, I believe you have a responsibility. Um, uh, you know, is your rhetoric uh, perpetuating social stereotypes? Is your rhetoric perpetuating divisiveness, hate? It's a huge responsibility, and uh, you would uh, one would be surprised how much this younger generation looks up to people in positions of power, to people who have a voice, to people who have a platform. So it's very important, uh, specifically for these harmful and extremist practices, to not to only discontinue. But for this new generation also to be socialized in a way that's moving forward responsibly. So uh, in terms of social media, and you mentioned social media mavens in your book and how they are part and parcel of this narrative, um, how can we uh, enforce more of a responsible way to act as a global community, especially using the World Wide Web? Well, look, I, I, will, I will say this to you. Um, <laughs> Bill talked about my book tour last year, and I was very fortunate to go to many World Affairs Councils all over the country. And the thing I said about hate and extremism is that we have been lazy on hate. Um, you know, we have expected other people to take this on. It's too complicated. It's too difficult. And I would say something very similar around the issues of gender. Um, it is too, too, you know, ingrained in culture. It's just the way they do things. It's just, you know, we, we're looking in the other direction. Yes, it's important, but, you know, it's not, I, I'm not going to do anything. It is, it is language. It is uh, focus. It is walking the walk. Um, so this is even before, before social media. How are you teaching kids? What are we, what are, what are our curriculums sharing? How are we talking about things? Who's sitting around a policy table? You know, who do, who do young people see? I'm so happy you brought up the, 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 the young person component. In fact, millennials, Generation Z and Generation Alpha should be our priority and our focus. We should be culturally focused on that, those dimensions because they're all digital natives. They all are learning from each other. If you are sitting, uh, in Boston, you are connected to someone somewhere else uh, around the world in real time and, and learning from each other. Good things can happen from that and bad things can happen from that. So what are we 
understanding about these generations. I call it cultural listening. It's not my terminology. It's just what is in that space. Those people that really are listening to what's happening with these generations, policymakers aren't attuned to those little societal changes that happen across the board. So a woman growing up at age 14, um, you know, in one part of the world and her experience is not the same experience or, 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 um, you know, uh, ecosystem in which she's living as somebody who's 27 in another part of the world, we can't have the same policies for both kinds of, of groups. And so a, a focus on, on, on these groups, the focus on regions, a focus on culture, um, how they are absorbing what's taking place day to day. Um, but also now let's take this into the more, just that's a little bit soft. Let me get a little bit hard here. Mm -hmm. We have looked the other way on these issues of gender inequality, the experience of what women and girls are going through. Mm -hmm. um, we, in, in the world that I work on with hate and extremism, I've often talked about the fact that a mother is a child's first teacher, what, mm -hmm. how she raises her family in that house, mm -hmm. um, apartment, um, dwelling of, of whatever kind, she is she is the caretaker for humanity. She is teaching that next generation how to be. What are we doing to understand that? And how are we incorporating women into these conversations? There should not be policy tables in which it's all guys all the time. We ought to have diverse and inclusive policy tables so that we are bringing new ideas to the table and new experiences to the table. And then thirdly, Listen, this issue of technology is critical. I wanna call out a book that's just come out for those people who are watching and are, um, are parents or, or have um, young people in their lives. It's a book by Urs Gazer and John Palfrey um, called The Connected Parent, uh, and I urge you to read it. Um, it is about what is happening specifically to the generation that is doing things that you don't even understand and absorbing as their brains are developing. Nina, you use the word identity, you know that is throughout my book, I talk about the most important thing we need to understand is what's happening to a young person as they are processing their identity because it has to do with everything. And so what I would say is how are we adults mm -hmm. looking to technology companies to help us develop the norms that we believe as a society are important. And if we look the other way, we're being lazy on this. OK, we cannot allow um, others to define the society that we want to be in when we know it's not equal and it's not inclusive. So more needs to be done to um, to engage uh, on these issues in the ways in which young people are connected. And that has to do with technology. Well, Farah, this also brings up uh, the question of accountability, yeah. not just um uh, on social media, but it is specifically in, as you brought up mothers, parents, um, also educators, you know, yeah. when you're talking about uh, what social psychologists and social scientists refer to as the impressionable years, which are the most important formative years when uh, of, uh, for identity formation specifically, what children are seeing in textbooks, what is being communicated to them in the school system, in conjunction to that is the home life. Those are two primary areas of socialization during the formative impressionable years. Now, how do you hold educators accountable? What's more difficult, that is easier to navigate in some ways than what goes on in the household. That is very difficult to navigate. That is very difficult. To, and you know, uh, in terms of studies, let's look at the U.S., for example, this misperception that the U.S. is one of the leaders in gender advancement and women's advancement. When you look at the statistics that just came out last year of the World Economic Forum, out of 153 countries, the U.S. comes in at 51. So these are eye-opening statistics. What's even worse is the U.S. has fallen 23 points since 2015. Then you look at studies that come out that girls in the US by age of six believe they're less capable of intellectual brilliance than boys. So you have to think what we are doing collectively as a society that's contributing to social stereotypes regarding women's capabilities at such a young age. Because as you and I both know, no one is born with limited perspective. 
It is ingrained and learned early on um, and primary areas of socialization. Um, and how do we address that as a society? I know it's not so easy to navigate. I know there is no magic potion for this. There is no cure for this, but there has to be something and some entities that are held accountable, just like uh, you know, you're talking about prejudice, biases, all those things that are part and parcel of the same narrative. Um, how do we go about responsibly moving forward? Because yes, the pandemic in many ways has been devastating, not just for women and girls, but for pretty much, I, I can't think of anyone it hasn't impacted. But to me, I look, the, I look at this juncture as an opportunity to not to go back when people say, oh, I wanna go back to normal. I don't think what we had was normal. So an opportunity to build beyond uh, the narrow reforms, the narrow policies, the narrow mindset even of the past. How do we move forward in a way where we can enact meaningful change, where we can pull together social scientists, educators, uh, even global youth? And what you mentioned, Generation Z. Uh, and from the count, the difference between millennials and Generation Z from the countless studies that have been done is this generation is not only more ethnically and racially diverse, they actually uh, value it and embrace it as a good thing. So that's a huge plus moving forward. So how do we capitalize on a generation that actually for the first time in a very long time views diversity as a plus? So, you know, you and I are both products of all women's colleges. And, um, and I think that there's something to be said about lessons in terms of what we saw, what we learned, what was in the ecosystem and the ethos of those campuses where the sky was the limit, that there was a history and uh, a legacy of women who came before us who added value to the planet. Um, and so there was never the sense of, um, you mean, you're self-selecting when you go to a women's college, I understand that, but, but there were no barriers put in front of you that you could do anything. And I think that kind of ethos must come um, into every state in America. You cannot expect a young girl to believe she can do anything. If it's a one-off, then you say that there is a scientist, that there is a this and there's a that. That's great. And those are great role models. It has to be all day, every day. It has to become part of every touch point that they see. And it cannot just be women doing this. It's got to be, it's got to be a comprehensive attention to the fact that most important point, do we believe as Americans that all people are equal? Mm -hmm. Do we believe that fundamentally? No. And if we do- but, Well, but, you and I both know, know that that's yeah, well, the case, unfortunately. But, but, but if we are saying this, mm -hmm. then states, you ask, what do we do? Um, it, it is not gonna come, uh, there's not a decree that is gonna come from on high that takes a magic wand and makes every state in America this way. It mm -hmm. is going to take mayors uh, and school boards and governors to say what we stand for in our city, in our town is this, these are the things we stand for and they have to be able to uh, approach it in a way, I don't, I'm not Pollyanna, you know, I don't think it's suddenly going to happen, but I think that there are enough mayors and governors that the needle can move and that comprehensively across America, there's been a call out, Nina, I think you will agree that yes. we are beginning to see um, Generation Z and millennials call out to companies to say, mm -hmm. what you're doing, what, what do you stand for? I'm right. not going to be a, a customer if you don't stand for the things that I stand for. Okay, those are important, those are important things. And let, let me not just now take it to the federal level, and I'm not trying to be political here, but it is directly related to what you're asking. Correct. If you have um, a bully pulpit um, from the White House being used to, to send signals that say everybody is not equal, mm -hmm. and you don't see diversity around that policy table, it is a message to the rest of the world and ourselves about what we value. Correct, which is which right. Is, you know, accountability issue in people who are in, and I put it in quotes, role model assignments, right? Uh, whether you yeah. like it or not, certain positions make you 
by default a role model. So you have to be careful how you speak, how you engage. And the other factor is how we, as a society, tend to overlook the value of diversity all around. You know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to enforce quotas, right? That's a whole different thing than actually, you know, creating a workforce that actually embraces and values diversity across the board. Nina, and you I know, what, one thing I just do want to say is that I don't, I absolutely agree with you. But we haven't looked at it, in my view, that's one way of looking at it, by the statistics of, is the X organization this percent diverse? Mm -hmm. In fact, the other way to look at it is, has the system that we have worked or has it not worked? And if it's not working, we've got to do something to change it. And this goes back to what I said when we started, how do you solve complex problems? You have to bring a whole range of people to the table to give you those perspectives. So it is exactly which is how do you how do you look to the future to say, if everything that we've done in, in the past has not produced what we want it, to pro mm -hmm. want it to be, what must we do going forward? And this is where you change it. But Farah, my uh, challenge in my area of work is that I say you can change all the discriminatory laws and policies and make everybody equal, okay? But that doesn't, how do you change stereotypical assumptions? How do you how do you erase racism, prejudices, even prejudices that people are not even necessarily aware that they have and they impart um, to their community? See, those are things that um, you can't wave a magic wand and, and make social stereotypes disappear. You can't make racism disappear. But how do we work together as a community and move forward in a way that actually shows the value of embracing diversity and uh, beyond, I call it, you know, um, the ad women and stir formula, beyond the ad women and stir formula, beyond the ad, the, uh, you know, person of color formula. Those things to me are just, uh, forgive my language, window dressing and window dressing. don't uh, yield any kind of benefit and, and frankly send the wrong message. So I have some good news for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> It is not as though we don't know how to do this. The, the issue is we haven't wanted to do it. So we are human beings. We are social animals. We talk to each other. Well, mm -hmm. now it's on Zoom, but in normal times, um, meaning non-COVID times, um, we have the ability to connect human to human in a different way. And what we know is that to break down walls of stereotypes, stereotypes and bigotry and all these things that you learn, um, you've got to meet the other. You have to find ways to do that. And that's what I say in terms of the good news. We've done this. We've experimented with this. We do this in a lot of different ways. Um, why aren't we doing that here at home? Why aren't we learning how to, uh, I mean, I made an argument in an op-ed in the Boston Globe earlier this week about less, this exact thing lessons from foreign policy we do this around the world in almost 200 nations we connect to foreign audiences we learn how to we have exchanges we talk we do all these things it sounds so simple but mm -hmm. in fact we have a toolkit for diplomacy that in my view should be used at home because we have a divided country we have a country of us and them we have a country on many 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 levels not just politically but on the, on the gender side too, it is going to take people to say, I'm going to take a step in the right direction to listen. We have not learned how to listen to each other in our country. So even if what you are saying or somebody else is saying is unpleasant, it's difficult, it's challenging. We have broken down the capacity to be civil and compassionate in how we listen and how we engage. That's actually the solution. There, there's no magic wand needed. It is a focus and attention on, on doing that. And, and unfortunately, Nina, we have lost that thread. We are not willing to put the time in and the effort, this issue of laziness, I, I bring back to you because it does require focus. It does require attention, but we know how to do that. We know how to bring people together. We, in the United States, we have solved all kinds of issues when we have actually collaborated. One of the things that I used to do as a diplomat is talk about how um, 
how one of the strengths of our country was the coalitions that we were able to build. I'm not sure I can say that right now, um, but it is true that we, we know that you can find common gr ground. Um, this issue of civility and compassion and kindness and how we talk, I think is the starting point. And I think it's a way um, certainly at the, at the education level, I mean, for, for young kids, and I think we have to start there. Um, I, I think we have to, to really go all in, in rekindling um, th the experience of being kind um, and what, what that really means. I agree. And just to add to what you're saying, I completely agree with what you're saying. I actually was talking to a work colleague last week and said, I, you know, I immigrated to the U.S. when I was 12 from Iran at the cusp of the 1979 revolution. I'm 54, I've been here 42 years. I have to say, I have never seen so much hate and divisive rhetoric um, thrown around without any regard to anybody's ethnicity, cultural background, religious beliefs, as I have this past year. Um, in fact, this past year I feel has been the most toxic since I've been living in the US to the point where I have no tolerance uh, for this kind of language. I have zero tolerance for disrespect. I don't even frankly engage with people who resort to this kind of a mindset to the point where I have never blocked so many people on social media as I have this past year, but it's almost like a cleansing for me. You know, I don't need that kind of energy around me even in cyberspace. So to, to the reason I'm bringing this up is we all have um, the power to control who we allow in our space, whether it's cyber or personal. And I think that's also a huge responsibility because if you keep your doors open to toxic people like that, to people who um, you know, use hateful language, use divisive language, use defamatory language, then you're essentially signing up in some way and, and you are part and you are guilty of perpetuating um, this type of behavior in some ways. Well, I think your own responsibility over con controlling an environment, especially in the time of COVID when um, emotions are high, it's, it's, there, there's a lot of fear uh, for health and, and family and, and other things. And there are many different things that conditions in the last eight months have been extremely tense and difficult. Um, so on top of that, if you add in hate and spite and mockery and all of the other things that go along with social media, it becomes even more dangerous and toxic emotionally for you um, and also physically, because we've, we've also seen an increase of um, you know, threats and, and that kind of thing um, because of the rise of white supremacists in our country, um, and which is you know, beyond comprehension to me that we are at a place where we are dealing with what we're dealing with, which is why I will say to you, I think as, as we look at America today, um, we've got to really think about the systems that we can put in place in our country to begin again mm -hmm. and to figure out how to talk with each other. And this isn't just sort of like, I'm up here, I've walked this walk, I've done this all around the world, it is hard. It is hard to listen sometimes, but we know that it can be done. You know, I remember when I was special rep to Muslim communities, traveling to places where people would say nasty things about different religions. And I'd ask the young person, well, have you ever met a Hindu? Mm -hmm. Well, no, but I know all about it. Have you ever met a Jew? Have mm -hmm. you ever met a, and it's like, no, because all of the stuff is happening in their ecosystem and they think they understand it all. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the other way, the other way around as well, um, it, one of the harsh and very sobering things for me, Nina, and I haven't really said this very publicly, um, but one of the things, when I was special representative to Muslim communities, I traveled to nearly a hundred countries on behalf of our, our nation. <clears throat> and I'd, I'd heard a lot, seen a lot, I, good and bad, you know, conversations about um, different ethnicities and religions. And, but as somebody who came to this country when I was a baby, I was one and a half. Um, I came and lived outside of Boston. I'm a proud you know, Massachusetts native. Um, I thought I knew my country, obviously. And, but on this book tour, I traveled to, I think, 30 states and 55 cities. And one of the things that blew me away is how much hate there was. 
and the things and people would come to my book talk because they wanted to hear about my book, which is how to stop young people from joining groups like Al Qaeda or ISIS. And, 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 and it is in fact a positive message because there's something, but what I would hear from people who self-selected to come, not everywhere, but enough that it became a pattern, these really vile expectations around, you know, different races, um, different heritages, uh, about Islam, uh, various things. And it was very painful to hear because as an American, I would think to myself, my God, you have the internet at your fingertips. If you have a question, you can get, I mean, we, no other time that we know of in history that people with a swish of their finger can get an answer to a, a question, but where are we getting the answers? You know, people don't even understand that. So the, the, the context of this is to simply say, your point about this past year being so hate filled, um, mm -hmm. I experienced last year on the ground during my book tour and it made me sad for America, but it made me realize too, the, one of the reasons why so many of these people who had no ideas about some of the things that I was talking about is because they haven't been exposed mm -hmm. to, to Muslims. They don't know anything about Islam, really. They see news stories and they think they understand it. And, and that goes back to your question about what's happening in schools. How mm -hmm. do we, what are we teaching about each other, whether you're an Italian or you're, um, you know, a Chinese person or, or you're Brazilian, there's more that we need to be doing in our school system to open up the world to each other. Hello, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hello, hello, Farah. Hello, Nina. We have questions piling up now from the viewers on the live stream. So I, I hesitate to break into your conversation. It seemed like there may be a pivot there. So um, thank you so much for sharing these perspectives. Uh, the first question comes from Shahid Kadri. Do you think establishing, and it can be for both of you, do you think establishing and, and strongly supporting a network of young Malalas in the US and around the globe will contribute to the acceleration of efforts under discussion? Mia, I'm, jump in. Well, uh, Bill, in term, well, there's, unfortunately, I hope, you know, we wish there were more Malalas out there, you know, um, that, that would come into the, you know, narrative that would be covered. There are, more Malalas out there, that's a great question. Unfortunately, why we don't hear about them, we should hear about them. I get countless correspondence on social media um, about so many phenomenal young women, um, you know, breaking barriers in their own communities. So many uh, young girls who are not uh, fortunate enough to be living in a country like the United States. So many young girls living in regions that have so many obstacles, structural, cultural obstacles, social stereotypes, but they continue to break barriers and make strong contributions to their communities. Their stories are fascinating. And um, I, I don't wanna say Iran because I'm from Iran, but you know, you're talking about young women in Iran, young girls in Iran that are, you know, excelling in practically every field, despite being in a patriarchal country in which the slightest infraction has huge penalties. Mm -hmm. So these are, that was a great question. I, um, I know there are countless Malalas out there. Unfortunately, why their stories don't come out, I think we need to make more of an effort to bring out their voices, to share their stories, because um, I always say if we accomplish something in America as women, that's great, but it's the Malalas of the world that need to be applauded because they are doing it, being up against so many obstacles and their courage and their resilience and their conviction is something that needs to be echoed loud. And it is something that is very important specifically for the next generation to be exposed to. Great. Farah, did you want to respond as well? The only thing I'd say is um, that young people, the connection of young people and bringing up their experience and their ideas is a great investment. And we've seen the impact of that in our programs around the world, both US government programs, mm -hmm. by the way, and programs that are done by NGOs. So we know that model works. Um, so on the question, I'd love to see that in America, by the way. 
I'd love to see networks of young people who are different get connected around common themes. Um, and this is where the money comes in. Uh, this is where we ask ourselves, what can companies do to build resilience in communities? This is a great answer. This is a short and maybe philosophical question from Mary Eintema, my colleague at World Boston. Why are women frightening? <laughs> I'm tempted to say because they don't carry guns. Why are they frightening? This is a lady asking this question. This is a lady. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, Farah, you want to take this? I don't find women frightening. I mean, maybe, maybe some people might think find women threatening. I mean, I would have to say like in Iran today, the regime is definitely finding women threatening, which is why they try to silence them at every turn. Uh, the fact that these women don't, uh, uh, you know, sign up to the regressive ideology, to the patriarch patriarchal ideology perpetuated for the last 42 years by the regime actually makes them in a way more threatening. They are the Achilles heel to the current regime. So I don't think they're frightening. I think maybe they're threatening because they have the conviction and the strength and the courage to keep moving forward despite the fact that they have historically been barred from so many fields, from realizing their full potential. They do realize their full potential, despite the fact that so many doors have been closed and continue to be closed on them. So that's my kind of the way I'm spinning the question. Farah? <laughs> well, I think, it, I think it's interesting um, because the way I heard the question was this. Um, you know, I, I often think to myself as people look at a, a, another human, um, doesn't have to be a gender thing, and, and if they see fear, it's something inside of themselves that they are having an issue with. Is it a power thing? Um, is it an ego thing? Is it, it, is it an insecurity somewhere else? And, um, and, I, and I, cannot, I cannot answer the question directly, it's because of this, but it, it is unfortunate that so much around um, the gender question becomes the haves and haves not, have nots and who controls power and, um, and, and who gets to solve problems. If we took that hierarchy component off the table and just said, as humans, we've got to solve this issue of, you know, let's pick, up, pick an issue, uh, migration, uh, climate change, what are the best ideas? We would go at it as humans going, what is your, how would you, you know, we would look at it differently as opposed to that person sitting at the head of the table and that person hap happens to be female or male. Now let's just take one more piece of this. Um, have you noticed during the COVID um, crisis that we're in that many of the countries that have done really, really well with mm -hmm. managing the threat have been female leaders. Sure. And there has been a lot written about this. And I'd love to make hay and, and talk about all the reasons why. But that's also um, interesting that it's been talked about in this way, rather than saying, was there an approach that this kind of leader took? And it could have been a male leader that took that same approach, but it just happened to be an op. I mean, we haven't, we haven't dissected it that way. So I think it has to do with um, what's happening inside and sort of a power structure on the outside as well. That's a very good point. I did notice that um, so many women leaders did really do a terrific. I'm not at all surprised, but I'm not going to go in that direction. I'm not going to go in that direction. I'm not surprised <laughs> either, actually, but it's it's wonderful to see. Yes. Um, and um, again, this hopefully moving forward, this is also something we can bring into our conversations. An anonymous question here. You spoke about the role of social media and technology. What is the best strategy to adopt in areas that do not have access to the internet or social media when it comes to reducing violence against women and girls? This is important, um, especially the internet access, because there are safe cities that are, you know, in India and elsewhere where they're using technology to track errant behavior by, by men. Um, What's your answer to the places that 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 don't have that rural well, areas a, that, that you know? There was a world before technology, and um, and we send signals in our um, in our actions and what's around um, that teach people behavior, and we have to deploy 
those mechanisms. We've gotten very comfortable with, you know, building the app or doing the, and I'm not, I'm not anti-technology, but, but there are fundamental things that can happen um, in terms of changing behavior and offering insights that you see, um, even if it's a, if it's an area that doesn't have television, for example, um, there are things that we can do in terms of, um, and, and I mean, I worked at USAID for a long time. And so I would see in rural, um, rural places that sort of the learning process and, and how you can even games that are played in schools mm -hmm. uh, that can teach lessons uh, in a very indirect way. There are ways to do this. But probably more challenging these days sure. because everybody has gotten so used to connecting over the internet that I think it takes out a lot of the human element. Um, unfortunately, I think prior to the internet, people made more of an effort to stay connected. It has become very easy now to sort of disconnect in the way that we used to connect prior to the prior to technology, which is unfortunate in many ways. And before we got, went on air, I was telling uh, I was telling Bill how I miss the human connection. Um, and, you know, it is a good thing we have the internet during COVID because that is one way to stay connected. But I hope that people make more of an effort to um, reach out to one another beyond the web. One of the reasons I thought of connecting you both is aspects of your roles and your book titles. Um, Far, you, you included entrepreneurs in How We Win, and Nina, um, you are a UN Women Global Champion of Innovation. What part can entrepreneurs play in combating extremist threats and extremism? And I ask this maybe first to Nina because in entrepreneurship in our ecosystem, it's largely male driven still. We're yeah. trying to get women into STEM, but if, if all the entrepreneurs are men, they're maybe not thinking about how to do this. Well, and, and while we learn that, and while Nina answers, Farah, you're gonna be thinking about what we're, what we're gonna do with the, with the tools and the game we have that may just be deficient. Well, Bill, I'm glad you brought up entrepreneurs. The area that I, the specifically this initiative, which was launched by UN Women, is a new initiative. It was launched in 2018. And it's specifically in terms of the global champions promoting activities of UN Women that elevate um, the role of uh, women in STEM, but also address the low number of women in STEM and the entrepreneurial field, specifically how female entrepreneurs in America, again, Farah, you and I were speaking earlier about this misperception that America is you know, front and center in terms of women's advancement. Female entrepreneurs in America get less than 3% of all venture capital funding. So why that's happening is a long story. I wish we had another two hours, but it, you know, the long and short of it is that the VC model as it currently stands is uh, for lack of a better term, an essentially white male majority model, which means that women entrepreneurs get shortchanged at every turn, which means that we have to make more of an effort to see why that's happening. We have to make more of an effort to change this model inherently from what it is to one that is really uh, takes in and considers all angles of entrepreneurial field, uh, so in my line of work, which is specifically the low number of women in STEM and entrepreneurial fields and what accounts for that and what can be done to change this direction and to increase the number of women in those fields, I have to say women in this field um, are, have their hands tied pretty much because of the barriers and stereotypes that prevail in this field. I, I In terms of um, uh, preventing violent extremism, I think Farah would have to take the reins on that. And before she does, I just want to say, Nina, because you inspired us two years ago at our conference, last year we had Sarah Chen, who co-founded the Billion Dollar Fund for Women, which is to get that VC money in the hands of women, entrepreneurs and innovators. Farah. That's amazing. Well, th thank you. It's a really important component to, to, um, to s the solution set. Um, if you keep doing things the same way, you're going to get the same results. And we have not done so well on stopping young people 
from joining hate groups and extremist groups uh, across the spectrum, whatever kind of extremism we're talking about. And so what I advocated for um, when I was in government and why I wrote this book afterwards was to say, there are different kinds of thinkers that are outside of the silos, that have an entrepreneurial mindset that says, what is the issue we're trying to solve? Um, and can we bring them to the table? So these are social entrepreneurs and sometimes business entrepreneurs on how to reset um, the communities in which these young people come forward with. And I've met these, these young inspiring minds all over the world who, to Nina's point, don't have the funds to launch their ideas forward. So the kinds of cutting edge entrepreneurs I'm talking about are, are in that category, but also in the category of policymakers because policymakers aren't as creative, I believe, as they can be in solving some of the problems that we need to solve. And on the issue of hate and extremism, I want us to think about, we earlier in the conversation talked about identity and belonging and that the human brain doesn't develop until the age of 24. What's happening between one and 24 matters to issues of, of development, obviously, but also in identity formation and how they think about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we know that there are entrepreneurs who are working on play, on, in, a, in a wide range of ways to be able to help these young people think about themselves differently. So um, gaming platforms, educational tools, um, tons of connective programs with each other that are entrepreneurial, that are absolutely needed. You cannot just give a lecture about the, the, the problems of joining a group like the KKK or send out a you know, press release that says, you know, we don't stand by what ISIS talks about. That isn't gonna work for a 14 year old girl or boy. We've got to get into societies creatively. And I look to social entrepreneurs, I look to business entrepreneurs, and I look to policy entrepreneurs that can do this differently. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Leach, countering violent extremism as the current iteration of the global war on terror is built upon a global narrative that assumes all brown young men are, are security threats. How do we move the policy framework beyond these stereotypes? Well, I, I'm going to jump in, um, and I said no because I I, I just I, I do not agree with the way he framed the question, but I get what he's getting at. Uh, countering violent extremism is soft power. It's the ideological war to stop young people from joining groups um, that promote an us versus them ideology. Uh, it is not about targeting. Um, one slice of humanity or another. It is to say, what can we do to prevent youth writ large from joining these groups? And it started um, right after 9-11, it is true, and was named countering violent extremism. I know this because I was at the policy tables that, was do that were doing that. Um, and if you're interested in the deeper dive of how that was thought about, I urge you to, to you know, you don't have to buy my book, go to the library, check it out, but, but read about it. But what we have to understand is the ideological component of the, the, the thing that we are facing, the threat that we are facing from the Proud Boys, from the Boogaloo movement, from, um, from ISIS, from Shabab, and everything in between is a threat about young people getting lured into their armies. And we as humanity have got to protect our youth. We do this with child predators around sexual violence, we do this in a whole host of other ways. I do not understand why it is okay for us not to be talking about the issue of ideology and what we should be doing together. So CVE, countering violent extremism, is non-kinetic. It is soft power. It is the tools in our toolbox that is everything that Nina and I were talking about in terms of identity and belonging. How do you get, let me give you a, a, a very concrete example of, uh, of something that is a CVE program taking former extremists, former neo-Nazis, former Shabab, former IRA, former FARC, any of these people and taking the content of their experiences. Here's why I joined, here's why I left and using that content to develop in a lot of different ways um, the exposure to young people so that they go, oh my God, that happened to that person. They're a credible voice mm -hmm. in this. I don't wanna join the KKK. I don't want to join 
the FARC. I don't want to join uh, Shabab. So that is what this is are all they about. Penetrating, are they penetrating the dark web in the areas where these youths that are susceptible to those messages? <clears throat> so um, I will tell you that there are some amazing NGOs of former extremists who are begging for attention um, because they don't, I mean, they're NGOs. So they're trying to get funding. So they are doing their best. Sometimes, some of these NGOs, Parents for Peace, by the way, um, is also another really good organization or the Against Violent Extremism Network that we helped found. But I'm saying this because if they had, they've been able to do things online um, with one-to-one -one interventions with young people who are thinking about joining a neo-Nazi group, for example, um, or, um, or, or to, to go into places that are not um, common to be able to dig down and see what is, what is happening. But Bill, the problem is the scale isn't there. So while it may be happening, it's not, an, not enough of it is happening. And that's one of the biggest problems um, in, the, in the soft power fight that we have right now all these good ideas haven't been scaled. I have there one there question. Hasn't, there hasn't been that much soft, soft power. Nina, I have a question have for you. A, oh, I was oh, gonna ask her a question. Do you mind? Because this came oh, up and I was gonna ask her during our conversation and we just had so much to talk about, but because this question was just brought up, I have been meaning to ask you for the last hour, do you feel that the current situation provides an opportunity for extremist groups to capitalize on a deteriorating situation. That's been at the top of my mind to ask you this entire time. And I'm sorry to jump in, Bill, but no, I, no, no. I, I, I just wanted to get Farah's perspective on um, in terms of opportunity for extremist groups to infiltrate given the deteriorating situation we are facing. Uh, I will say this, we were, how do I want to say this and not sound dramatic? Um, it is more dangerous in America today than it was right after 9-11. And uh, it isn't just because there's been a rise of um, white supremacists. It's because groups like um, the neo-Nazi movement in our country and others alongside groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and Shabaab are learning from each other. It is because they're learning tactics from each other, they're exploring how to do things, and they're understanding your word, opportunity. Where are the places where they can go in to recruit fast and, it is and an build off? So it is a extremely dangerous opportunity, and the data that bears that out of people who've taken advantage of um, America that has not been leading on this issue that has looked the other way when, when, and again, I don't want to make this into a political conversation, but if you think hate is okay, you're sending a signal to hate groups that it is okay to do the things that they're doing. So recruitment has increased, tactics have increased, and the potential for danger has increased. So yes, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Well, I was going to add, that's very good that you, you put it there because frankly, when you have a leader who in a presidential debate is dog whistling the way our president did in the first debate, that's not only a cause of really horrible things from Michigan or Wisconsin or anywhere else, the global re repercussions of that are huge. And so we have an incoming administration that has to tackle the divisions, that has to, that has to somehow figure out a way to address the extremism here, which you say is more dangerous than 9-11, that's, that's a statement, but also has to face um, emerging and re-emerging extremist threats, as we've seen in Vienna, Nice, and so forth. What, what, what do you think the, the Biden administration is going to do to attack that? Well, I don't, I don't know. Um, I can hope um, that, that he's going to build off of uh, what he has said publicly, which is there is going to be no space for hate. He will call things out as we see them. Um, and it, we are going to see, I believe, um, more action on the soft power toolkit uh, that we know has worked. Um, the problem, and I, I want to not just put this in the executive branch, I think it is very important that we understand the legislative branch as well. They have looked the other way financially. How do you expect our country 
to build the kind of momentum we need when they don't have the funds to do what it is they need to do. So I would say that we've got to get Congress to give money to, towards these soft power programs. And where does that go? It goes to the NGO pro programs on the ground, the community programs that we know work. So one, one piece of this is Congress. The other is the way a President Biden and a Vice President Harris will conduct themselves and their foreign policy and the attention that they place on the, rising, uh, the rise of hate globally and the impact of this. Because Bill, one of the things that is, is very, very sobering is that the numbers of young people are growing globally, which is all a good thing, but they're also the demographic from which the bad guys recruit. Mm -hmm. So any kind of recruitment. Um, the final thing I'll say is that um, you made a statement earlier and I, I didn't say anything, but I, I do think I just wanna put this in people's minds. Young people, um, even younger than people would imagine, Autumn Waffen, which is a, a neo-Nazi type group, um, is talking about recruiting seven and nine year olds, okay? This is not new. Um, Hitler uh, set himself up to get re new recruits. So we're looking at a younger generation of, of soldiers in, in the white supremacist movement alongside the, the, the hell that's being unleashed in other parts of the world with young people, one. Two, we haven't talked about women. One who, part who of this- are extremists? Who are getting recruited? Right. And one part of this is the impact of horrible, Nina talked about sort of women experiencing violent extremism and what happens. The other side is what happens when you get a young girl or a woman who becomes an extremist and what she does with that power. And so we have a, a double-edged sword uh, going on on the, on the women's um, piece of this. And we actually haven't talked about the, gr the growing threat, in my view, of, of women getting radicalized and what that's going to mean. I was gonna ask you that as well. We, we, I said we were having a, such a great back and forth that that was also on my well, list. We, we, need to, we need to ha have you back to talk about that next time and not a year from now. I'm gonna close with a question for Nina, uh, an anonymous question and a nod to anonymous as a woman, your book. Uh, in countries, and this is good, in countries, sad, but good, in countries such as Pakistan, where child marriage, rape, and gender violence is rampant, governments have simply not done enough. How do you hold governments more responsible for the violence against women in their countries? How do you hold them more accountable, let's say? That's a, that's a really great question and also speaks to the essence of how we began our conversation with Farah, that despite so many countries having enacted laws against gender-based violence, it is happening at an alarming rate. Um, and yes, governments need to be held accountable. I think the UN has to be sitting there. I think international human rights organizations, I think, uh, you know, need to hold these types of governments accountable. Iran is another country that continues uh, to look the other way with respect to such violent tactics and violent behavior that, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, these governments uh, are getting away with such behavior. One is it's unfortunately part and parcel of a patriarchal fabric um, where you look the other way when such atrocities happen. I can go on and on about what's happening in not just Pakistan and numerous, countless other countries where uh, this type of atrocious behavior is part and parcel of society. And in many ways, it's just it goes from one generation to the, to the next. And that is the problem is you have, and I don't wanna say this, you have husbands and fathers who sign up to this type of behavior, who okay this type of behavior. You know, there is the fact that uh, fathers will say, my daughter shamed me. So they make it okay and acceptable to undertake such atrocities. What do you expect from a government when you have a parental figure signing up for this? So it goes beyond uh, the country, it goes beyond the person sitting there on top of the food chain. It goes back to the families of some of these young girls 
and the messages that they are giving the government that it's okay. Um, I, I don't know if you remember the movie, India's Daughter. Um, again, this goes back to governments being held accountable and people looking the other way. Again, it's part and parcel of the fabric of certain cultures, unfortunately. It's part of the structural inequalities that continue from one generation to the next. Um, so it's not so easy to hold a government accountable when you have to go to the parental uh, party and say, this is your daughter, this is, you know, this is your wife. Um, so it's, it's more convoluted and complex than holding a government accountable, unfortunately. Farah, the last word for you. I was just going to say, I think this cultural piece is really important and for us to understand and unpack um, why it is the way it is and what we can be doing from the inside, not just from the outside. And I'm going to say that I think we're going to find that we will be willing to hold our own government more accountable than it has been in recent years, both for good reasons and for reasons that people who haven't been doing their jobs in uh, somewhere nearby where I live um, in Washington, D.C. should have been doing their jobs. So with that little uh, hint, this brings uh, this session, the fourth keynote, really the last program program to, of the conference to a close. And I've been looking forward to it hardly because it's the last program. It's because you two were going to be speaking with each other and I knew it would be a very rich conversation. So I'm grateful to Nina Ansari and Farah Pandith for joining us tonight. We do want to see you again at World Affairs Councils. To my colleagues, it, it is the end, but it isn't the end. Tomorrow, we are celebrating our third Council of the Year. Santa Fe Council on International Relations will be hosting its Journalism Under Fire conference, especially uh, covering crisis in China, which yours truly happens to be moderating with Julia McCarthy of NPR, Bob Davis of the Wall Street Journal, and Ling Ling Wei's editor, it turns out, because poor Ling Ling was caught in a very terrible fire accident today. But we will have a good discussion, poor Ling Ling. Uh, and then after that, council colleagues, uh, a, an afternoon's worth of leadership development workshops. Please join us. You know where the schedule is. It's on World Affairs Council's National Conference website. Farah, again, Nina, again, thank you for joining. Sorry about the commercials. Thank you very much again tonight and be safe. Happy thank Thanksgiving. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night.